Thomas Thwaites. Hello. Um, yeah, I was apparently scheduled to be on yesterday uh, with, you know, Bhagwan Chowdhury and R R Rachanda Pachauri, uh, head of the IPCC and Nobel Prize winner. Um, but then the president of Iceland phoned up and said, hey, do you wanna, would you want to swap? And I was like, fine. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. And uh, since then, nothing has happened to kind of diminish my uh, acute case of imposter syndrome. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm a designer, um, and I've done a project which is vaguely relevant to the theme of a world rebalancing. And uh, it began with the kind of observation that, you know, most of what we're relying on today basically began as a collection of rocks and sludge buried in holes in the ground. But... You know, of course, it doesn't look like rocks and sludge now. It looks like HD projectors and laptops and electric toasters. Um, and I was kind of, you know, as a designer, very curious as to how this kind of insane sort of magical transformation takes place. Um, and I was also kind of inspired by this quote. Um, it's from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the fifth book in the trilogy. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and the situation it describes is the hero of the book, Arthur Dent. He's from 20th century Earth, and he finds himself marooned on a strange planet on the opposite side of the galaxy. Uh, and this planet is populated only by a kind of technologically primitive people. And so he's there, and he kind of, you know, assumes that with his you know, 20th century education and 20th century wisdom and 20th century elevated intelligence that he'll be able to transform their society with wondrous technology, but kind of after about three days realises that without the rest of human society, he can barely make a sandwich, let alone an electric toaster. Um, but arrogantly, I decided to disregard the lesson from uh, Douglas and, uh, and, okay, and decide, okay, well, I'm going to just try and make a toaster myself starting from scratch. So uh, I began by going to the shops and, uh, you know, buying the cheapest toaster I could find, working on the kind of misguided assumption that the cheapest toaster would be the simplest to reverse engineer and took it home and... Um, kind of to my dismay, discovered that inside this object, which I'd bought for just kind of £3.94, like less than 10 bucks, um, there were kind of 400 different bits making up this thing. If you really go down and take everything apart, subcomponents, sub-subcomponents. Um, and at that time, I hadn't yet realized that I was going to spend the rest of my life making a toaster. So I thought, OK, I'll try and like simplify and substitute uh, into kind of five key materials, and these were steel for all the grilling apparatus, mica, which is a heat and insulating mineral which the element is wrapped around, plastic for all the kind of plastic bits, uh, copper for the copper wiring and the other bits which look vaguely like copper, and nickel, uh, which I was going to alloy with copper to make the heating element. Um, so steel, how do you make steel? So I went to... Um, the Royal School of Mines, and uh, knocked on the door of the Rio Tinto Chair of Advanced Mineral Extraction and said, hi, uh, I'm trying to make a toaster. I need to make some steel. Uh, how do I make some steel? And um, yeah, and uh, he didn't just close the door. He sort of refreshed my high school knowledge. And, um, uh, and said, OK, steel, it's a form of iron, and iron, of course, comes from iron ore. So I phoned up an iron mine and spoke to this guy, Ray, on the phone and said, hi, my name's Thomas, I'm trying to make a toaster, I need to make some steel, uh, can I come up and, you know, get some iron ore? And he was like, yeah, OK. Um, yeah, I mean, wh when I got there, it emerged that he'd misheard me on the phone and thought I said that I was trying to make a poster. And so it wasn't kind of, he thought I wanted to take a photo or something. But, um, but yeah, so we kind of sat down and had a kind of conversation. Uh, oh, yeah. The person doing this mass production doesn't really understand what he's doing anymore. Yeah. Whereas yeah. when you do it on a small scale, you have to understand every bit of the process yeah, and, yeah. and what it's all about. Yeah. The big, big business destroys the human. Humans, really. They, they become uh, 
automatons in a system. They're no longer human beings anymore. Sorry to kind of, you know, like um, spring this on you, babe. A bed of limestone we're walking through is creased limestone and um, that was produced by uh, sea creatures uh, 350 million years ago um, in a nice warm sunny yeah, atmosphere yeah, yeah. and suddenly something changed yeah. and destroyed all that yeah. nice warm sunny atmosphere and produced a very murky sea which produced the bed of rock which is above us. Yeah. 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 Most, most um, ancient civilizations um, are prophesying that there's going to be um, a big change in the world in 2012. You can, when you study geology, you can see what's happened in the past in the world, terrific changes in the earth. Santa. <laughs> yeah, so as you can... Um, see by the Santa's Grotto. Um, yeah, Ray's mine was no longer a working mine. And um, I kind of got the impression from Ray that he thought it was a bit kind of ignomious that his mine was now a tourist attraction and kind of perhaps he was holding out hope that there would be some global kind of cataclysmic rebalancing uh, and so his mine would become a mine again uh, and be able to kind of compete with the vast operations in Australia. Um, and, uh, but I still, I, I managed to get my iron ore and um, I dragged it back to London in a suitcase with one wheel and, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah and then was faced with the task of okay how the hell am I gonna you know make this rock into toaster components um, and I went back to Professor Cillias and knocked on his door and said, OK, I've got my iron ore, how do I make it into steel? And he told me to go to the library. And um, I went to the undergraduate library, looked through the textbooks on metallurgy, and they w actually weren't very helpful for my purposes. They had wonderful flow diagrams of industrial processes. Um, but no box 1.1, you know, step-by-step -step instruction. So I ended up going to the History of Science Library and looking in uh, this kind of book. Um, and this is from the 16th century. Um, it's the first book in the West, at least, written on uh, minerals and metallurgy. Uh, and... Um, it's translated by President Hoover from the original Latin. And uh, this kind of lovely woodcut at the end here um, is basically what I ended up uh, doing. Um, you know, and that was, you know, recurred throughout the project. You know, the smaller the scale you want to work on, the kind of further back in time you need to go. And sort of the 16th century was, you know, the last time people were smelting iron on the scale of, like, a person, and even there, there's four of them. Um, but, so that's essentially what I ended up doing, but I used a leaf blower instead of a set of bellows. Yeah, so after kind of a day and about half a night of, you know, shoveling in coke to my sort of chimney pot dustbin furnace, I, um, you know, looked through and got this out of the bottom. And initially I was kind of overjoyed. I thought, wow, I've actually managed to make metal from rock. I'm a genius. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it kind of, it, it, you know, it tasted metallic. It looked kind of like metal. Um, but unfortunately, when I actually went to try and start working it into toaster components, it shattered. Um, so, and I'd kind of used up all my iron ore and the furnace had melted during the process. So, um, so you know, in the long tradition of people, you know, trying to save their own labour, um, I looked around for some other ideas and uh, found a, a patent for industrial furnaces that use microwaves. So I went over to my mum's house and... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and so after about 30 minutes at full power, um, I was able to sort of get like lumps of, you know, okay-ish 
uh, reduced iron about this big. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So notice that's a different microwave. Um, <laughs> yeah, so then I moved on to copper. Um, and copper, I went to what was once the largest copper mine in the world in the 18, 1800s on the Isle of Anglesey in North Wales. And um, went down with a, a retired geology professor. Um, There's a whole place there, right here. So, your copper rich water. Are you familiar with the units, part per million? Which means you've got a millionth of a gram in one ml of water. Yeah, so the reason I'm getting water is because uh, water which trickles through a mine, partly due to this bacteria, um, becomes acidic and uh, will leach out the sort of metals from the rock. Um, uh, a good example of this is the Rio Tinto in Spain, which is a lovely kind of red color, highly acidic uh, and toxic to most forms of um, life. Um, but from the water that I got from my mine, I was able to electroplate out um, enough copper to cast some pins of my electrical plug and um, use the rest for uh, the electrical wiring. Um, mica came from uh, the highlands of Scotland. Um, <laughs> Again, an abandoned, abandoned mine, uh, abandoned after the Second World War. Okay, okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Workers. Um, yeah, and so plastic. So. Um, Plastic comes from oil um, most of the time. Uh, so I phoned up BP um, and spent about 45 minutes trying to convince this guy in the PR sort of office at BP that he should fly me to an oil rig in the North Sea and let me have a jug of oil. I should say this is before the deep water uh, disaster, and so I imagine the BP press office have a bit more on their minds at the moment. Um, but even then, <laughs> they, they were unwilling to, um, to fly me to an oil rig. Uh, they ended up by saying that if I needed a tanker full, it would be easier for them to help. So I looked at other ways of making plastic, and you can make plastic from potato starch. So I got some potatoes and extracted the starch and mixed up my potato plastic and tipped it into my mold. And for a while, that was looking very good, but I had to leave it outside. And I came back the next day, and it was kind of cracked, and there were snails around the edges <laughs> eating, my, eating my plastic case. So kind of out of you know, desperation, um, I thought, OK, I'll have to think laterally. And uh, geologists, there's a current kind of debate raging um, whether to christen a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. And um, the reason for this is geologists of the kind of far future without any knowledge of our civilization, would kind of be able to say that something happened just by looking at the strata of rock that's being laid down now. So, you know, suddenly it would become radioactive again. Um, there'd be a sort of extinction event, uh, us. And, um, and there would also be, in kind of uh, ice cores, uh, you know, polymers um, of plastics. So I thought, well, if I can mine kind of ancient iron-containing rock, can I not mine sort of a bit kind of newer um, sort of plastic rock from one of the many rich seams deposited around London? Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I, um, I thought, OK, I'll give that a go. And um, went up to Manchester to talk to this guy. He's the managing director of a firm called Axiom, and they're on the sharp end of the WE re uh, regulations, the, European Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive, which was brought into force to try and deal with, you know, all the crappy old iPhone 4s, which are just going to be littering the, littering the dustbins um, in a few years' time. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, yeah. The way the legislation's been implemented is a kind of everything into the melting pot together 
will divide up that huge tonnage according to the market share that you put on the market. And then you just have to buy evidence from a compliance scheme to show that you've done it. So with that, everybody's stuff goes into the pot together approach. The opportunity for any individual producer to take real responsibility for their products is really diminished. So if I as Dell or Hewitt Packard said, right, I'm going to invest millions of pounds into product redesign, minimize the number of materials, go for ease of dismantling, maybe use some of the clever dismantling technologies that exist, because if I got all my Hewlett Packard products back, I could put them through a plant and ping them apart really mm. cleverly, and I'd know all the plastics, I'd know all the metals, I'd know all the circuit boards, and I could then with confidence use it. That would be individual closed loop producer responsibility. There's no benefit for that under the legislation. Does flame retardancy mean anything to you at all? Or yeah, yeah. I was right. wondering if I could actually mine some bromelated flame retardants from myself oh. and put them in my taster. But, uh, oh dear, oh dear. So there's my finished toaster. Um, thanks. Um, there it is without the casing, and there it is <laughs> on the shelves. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Yeah, and you can see the price there, £1,187.54, I don't know, nine months or something. Um, yeah, so there's obviously a kind of uh, economies of scale issue <laughs> here, but um, I suppose also I was kind of wondering, you know, uh, there's such a lot of kind of effort and intelligence and history that goes into, you know, like even something like a toaster. And on the one hand, that's really great, I suppose, because, you know, it's one small reason why, you know, people like me can, you know, eat quickly and efficiently and then go and do stupid things like try and make a toaster. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, I don't know, is it worth putting all this time and effort and energy into something which, you know, has a very marginal uh, sort of addition to our existence. Um, I don't know, it's a kind of, yeah, yeah, we'll end it there, so thanks. <laughs>